A uh, big question we get with uh, working with producers and cover crops, especially on dryland systems, is how much moisture is it going to use and is it going to hurt my yield the next year and the cash crop. And so that's something that we've been talking about. We've seen different anecdotal stories um, from all over the place of no, it doesn't hurt and all that good stuff. And it produces, you know, basically uh, cover crops produce their own moisture, kind of a th that kind of a mentality. And so we're like, all right, we need to get some numbers on this deal. So. Most of you guys that have dealt with me on irrigation projects know that we like to monitor uh, soil moisture in order to schedule irrigation. So we have that technology available. Um, and so we have soil moisture sensors and uh, data loggers or handheld meters that you can manually check uh, for soil moisture. Um, and so that's what we ended up doing. We designed a, a little study. Oops, I hit the wrong button. Which one do I got to go? Uh, a study just uh, on one of these 223 grant, the picture that Sienna showed you um, with uh, a dry land system just west of Hardin. Uh, this is the one that was the uh, spring pea, hairy vetch, BMR corn, prozo millet, uh, white mustard, radish, turnip, and sunflower in the mix, about 25 pounds, 25.7 pounds per acre. Typical dry land mix that we uh, try to target in that, that range for uh, dry land systems, we don't want to go above 30, usually between 20 to 25 pounds of seed per acre is, is the target that we, we shoot for uh, with that diversity. Um, and so what we did was we uh, put these little stations in here. You can see this white pipe, uh, two white pipes there. Each one has a sensor mounted to the bottom of it, a rometer or water, a rometer, uh, um, oh, I don't know what the name of the sensor is, but uh, uh, it just basically comes up through the pipe as the wires for it, and you just we have a, just a manual handheld moisture reader that we plug in, and uh, it'll give you an instantaneous reading of the soil moisture in cinnabar, and then you can correlate that to moisture available in the soil profile. So what we did is we uh, took the, I don't know if I got the map on here. I think I was going to, but, oh yeah, there it is. Uh, so we've got cover crop and fallow side by side. Um, and it's all the same soils. I didn't put the soil map on here. Uh, this is all CB soil, uh, which is, I believe, well, this is uh, the, the stations we set up. So each station has two, two of those sensors, one at 12 inch and one at 30 inch in depth. Uh, at each of those, and each of these is a station. There's six stations total, three in the cover crop and three in the fallow. Uh, all in the same soil type and also topography wise, it's, it's pretty uniform out there. We just wanted to make sure we didn't have any uh, pockets or anything where moisture was, uh, the data was going to be skewed. Uh, we're, uh, so it, it, it's pretty uniform there and, and then the same soils. The, the aerial imagery, I think they had a fire previously or something. I can't remember what the, the story was, but uh, that's why it looks kind of different there. But it's not saline or anything like that. It's just the, and so that's the Kobe silty clay loam is the soils it's on, 48% slopes. Can't really read that, but um, the average water holding capacity, and since we're in a pretty much a, a grain rotation, small grain rotation, we look at four foot for the, the management depth. And so it will, on that soil, will hold 8.6 inches. So about that two inches per foot of depth of soil profile on the silty clay. Uh, so just a little bit more than that. So 8.6 is the average water holding capacity for that soil. So we put our sensors in at 12 inches and then also at 30 inches. So we're in the upper 25% of the it's just that slide, I think I, I did a clip on it. So we have that 12 inch to look at that uh, zero to 12 inch moisture level, how, that, uh, um, how the plants are using that water and then also down at that 30 inches, so we're down there towards the 75% of the, the soil, pro, or the rooting depth profile. So as uh, the, I think I had the wrong planting date there too. It was actually planted May 30th. I have, I got June 3rd. And so we, uh, sorry, <laughs> I installed the soil moisture sensors on uh, June 15th uh, out there. So the plants were just starting to come up. Um, uh, I got a picture of it later uh, here, but they weren't really using much moisture in that, that first couple weeks, um, just emergence. We had a pretty good spring. Uh, as you guys know, April and May, we had pretty good uh, spring moisture. I think around five inches or so on the, as recorded, just depending on what field you're standing in. Um, 2016 precipitation. So at each of those stations, I also had, well not at each, I had one rain gauge out there right in between the first three stations and the last three. Um, uh, we had a rain gauge sitting there too to, to capture any 
uh, local rainfall versus just what the weather station picks up here in town just to get some better data. And so this is the results of what we got off of the rain gauge, just going out there reading it after um, a rain event. Um, as you can see, this is a June 15th right here, uh, through June 15th to the end of uh, July right here. Uh, hardly anything. <laughs> we had a pretty, it turned hot and it turned dry, as you guys know, in June and July. Uh, very hot for June. Um, and so things were kind of just sitting there struggling. Um, and, and we see that later on. And then we did pick up some nice timely rains in August and then, of course, in September. But it, it was kind of like one of those things. And every, I would go out there once a week and take these readings and check on it. Uh, every Thursday at a certain time in the morning, I'd go out there, try to keep everything as uniform as possible. Um, to check the soil moisture uh, sensors on each site. And so you can see that on June 15th, the day we put the sensors out there, you can just start to see it's road pretty good. Um, see the corn, uh, BMR corn coming up and the prozo millet leafing out on June 23rd there. And Sienna just showed these photos here. So uh, July 28th, we had pretty good canopy cover, uh, pretty good growth, uh, just kept hanging on there. I mean, it was, uh, that was kind of fun to watch, even with the hot and dry weather that we were having, uh, stuff was still going. I mean, you see a little bit of leaf curl, a little bit of stress here and there, but uh, once it got to this stage here, it, it really did pretty well. So that's August and then uh, in September here, once we, I don't know when we got a frost kill on that, what date it was, but it was, <laughs> December, <laughs> yeah, 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 I don't think there was any frost up there. And, and so even the radishes in here, I thought that's pretty good for dry land, uh, the size of the tap roots that we were seeing in the cover crop. I mean, with the moisture that we had with a cool season crop like that, uh, with the radish, um, it just it hung on and uh, kept, kept going. So it's a no-till system, so we, we, and again, we had really good moisture in the spring, so everything had a good start. Um, it's just, uh, it, it was just a tough once it started to get growing here. And so this is the precip I just pulled off the NOAA website. Um, and uh, showing two, 2015 and 16. Um, and so June, it says that we had 0.17, July 0.71, and 1.94 in August. And so those differ a little bit from what I got on readings out of the rain gauge. I didn't have anything in the rain gauge out there at that field in June. Uh, July we had 0.35, so about half of what they were saying actually fell in town here. <clears throat> I think these are recordings taken at the courthouse, if I'm right, not mistaken. August 1.8 inches, and then in September 3.5 inches. And, uh, and so overall we had about 5.65 during the growing season uh, fall there in addition to what was already in the soil profile. So this is the data that I collected. You can, it's hard to read again at this scale, but uh, the dates that we were going out there. And then cover crop station one, 12 inch and 30 inch. And so station two, 12 inch and 30 inch. And then we had also soil temperature. I, I just put a soil probe in and take a temperature reading. Um, that's why I try to get out there same time of the day also, because throughout the day your soil temperatures can change, especially on the fallow. Um, and that was, I don't have the chart for that, but it did show uh, significantly cooler temperatures on that cover crop because of the canopy, of course, and then that all correlates with your soil biology and the activity. I mean, if you can keep, keep it in the optimal range of 70 to 80, you're going to have more activity in your soil profile, the biological, the micro, microbes, um, and so that's all beneficial to soil health. And the fallow, it, it did show um, a few degrees higher. And so charting all that out, this is the cover crop soil moisture uh, by date. And then also the, the blue is the average of the 12 inch sensors. And then the red is the, the 30 inch. So you're down deeper in the profile. So all through that real hot, dry period there, June, July, uh, without any rain, um, it held in there pretty good. The root zone, uh, the roots are developing down in there. And then you see at the end of July, it starts picking up. And the higher the bars are, the drier the soil's getting. Okay, uh, so that's how this works. This is in centibars, uh, zero to 200. Um, on our irrigation stuff, anytime we're getting uh, about 60 to 80 on the, on the readings, that's, that's the time to start irrigating. So on a dry land, that gives you kind of a, um, a benchmark, I guess, to look at here uh, of crop stress. Uh, the 60 to 80, you know, it did well through June and July. 12 inch and the, the 30 inch kind of held um, stable. 
uh, then you start seeing as those roots grow deeper into the soil profile start using up some of the moisture then even though we got some nice rains um, you can see where the, those roots uh, started really pulling the, or the can or the, uh, the vegetation um, of the of the crop uh, started using a lot more moisture there out of the profile uh, the 12 inch is the one that responds to the rain here we're getting dry and then we had a rain event uh, on August 11th or the reading on August 11th shows that it, that that moisture um, recovered or uh, recharged and then it started using it again because of the crop maturity again um, it's going to be pulling that moisture back out of the ground uh, not a whole bunch of change of the recharge on the 30 inch the moisture just didn't get down in there the crops were, were using it up and so that kind of looks like okay well obviously cover crops use moisture right um, so the story's not done yet. Uh, we're going to still monitor and, and check that now that it's in winter wheat, if, as long as it's okay with the producer. Uh, we'd like to monitor how both those treatments uh, with the soil moisture has, has recharged, especially with our fall moisture that we got. This is the fallow moisture with the same scale um, here on the side of 0 to 200 um, throughout the whole growing season. Uh, hardly any change. <laughs> Um, so this is showing that in the fallow system, it, uh, there, we weren't, I was surprised, even though it was conventionally cut too, it, it wasn't strip or stubble, uh, we weren't losing that much to evaporation on, out of that soil profile, at, at least at 12 inch and, and 30 inch. So I, th I think probably if you're going to see that moisture, it's going to be in the upper uh, six inches there, especially with evaporation issues. Um, so there's quite a difference there if you look between the two. We got soil moisture. Uh, um, being used up by cover crops. But production wise, as uh, Sienna had covered, we had about 1.8 uh, tons per acre. Uh, another thing is that that diversity of the, group, of the cover crop mix that we had out there uh, was phenomenal that we had all, uh, all species represented. Um, basically, you'd walk out there in the field and you see all that diversity. A lot of times with cover crop mixes that we find is uh, just a, a handful three or four become dominant and the other four or five that you had mixed in there, it's hard to find them. And, and this was a really good stand, real good diversity. And so the benefits that we're looking at, of course, we got forage production. Um, it was uh, decided to hay it off in order to plant um, winter wheat uh, for 2017. Um, but that forage production is, is a, a benefit, cash in the pocket, I guess, uh, towards the operation. Um, that they can feed to the cattle, um, but also the soil health uh, benefits of having that biology out there with a the living root, uh, forming that soil structure and all that good stuff that Marlin covered earlier um, is, is a good deal. Um, fall winter moisture, as you know, October, we had phenomenal rainfalls. That was great. I had over six inches in my gauge at my house, uh, but on the NOAA website, it only showed 4.4 uh, that it was recorded and hardened here. Um, and so I think we, we had to pull the rain, rain or the rain gauges, the um, soil moisture sensors at an uh, end of September, September 28th, we pulled them. Uh, because it was decided to, to hay, so I, di I didn't get back out there to, to probe and see what the soil moisture recharge uh, from this fall rains on both sit sites, the fallow and the, and the cover crop, but uh, be interested to see how it looks next spring, how we're sitting for, uh, I think, uh, my, my assumption is that we probably recharged everything that was lost uh, of that cover crop, uh, of the moisture to the cover crop on that side. Um, Again, it was kind of interesting too on the fallow, even though we had rain events in August and September, it, I mean, it's, it's not full capacity here. We're still getting readings of 15 or 20, I think it was that. Um, really didn't see much change there. So where, where's that moisture going? I don't know. Is it, is it just pushing lower? Or, I don't know. It's uh, kind of interesting. Maybe I had a problem with my sensors too. I don't know. We've had the problem with that in a study they did over in Baker uh, two years ago. They had uh, dry land corn and cover crops side by side, kind of did the same setup where they had sensors in both, showed that corn used all the moisture up and the cover crops didn't, didn't they basically created their own moisture. While well, they went out there and flip-flopped it for this year, put the sensors in the same site, and it showed that the corn produced its own moisture and cover crops used it all up. So they had a technology issue <laughs> on that. So, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, and that's why we're trying to replicate. They were consistent. 
Jewish answers were pretty consistent, though. Like yeah, yeah, that, yeah. All of the fallows. There was one that was pretty close to a sunflower or something. There, yeah, there was one on the cover crop there. I could tell exactly almost to the well, the week, I guess, when the root zone of that sunflower hit that 30-inch sensor because it just started sucking moisture right out because sunflowers are so efficient at, at uh, you know, scavenging moisture out of the profile. What is that scale? I can't see from back here. Yeah, it's terrible scale, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, zero down here, so that'd be saturated. And uh, two, well, actually 100 would be pretty, pretty dry. Uh, 200 is what the scale of that that moisture that. So you aren't measuring inches per. No, per no. You could go through some mathematics, I'm sure, and correlate this to inches in per foot profile. Um, at least it's all relative, I guess, to each other. So, um, with like the Paul Brown probe and all that stuff, we can we can correlate that pretty quickly with inches per per foot. I could do some. No, I'm not going to try. <laughs> I like challenges, but maybe not today. Um, uh, forage production again, 1.8, uh, and then these these. Uh, and so uh, here we had uh, 4.14 in October, then another three tenths in November, according to NOAA. But uh, um, we had, like I said, there was some areas close to Arden here that had a lot more rain than that fall in the gauge. So. Um, yeah, with that, uh, I think the, the, the story is, is or the, the ending is, is that it's not over yet. We're going to hopefully check, see where we're at next spring. Um, and also then if we can kind of see what production on that wheat um, um, harvest is and see if there's any changes you there. Had that three inches in September, if you had just had that in June. Yeah, I know. That would have, it would have really, it, I think, you know, especially. Half of it. Right, spread right. Spread it out. It would have. It would have been really interesting. It was the driest June in recorded history. Yeah. In a few different directions that you know we could look at in the future for soil moisture studies is you know seeing if if maybe we would have sprayed out that that cover crop in say the first right. of August or something, right. and and seeing how how that might have affected the, the soil. Soil moisture. Yeah, I think a lot of the production was made in. August and, and September too though it kind of sat there for June and July just because of the heat the moisture was in the profile but once it had to get to that growth stage to get the be able to start utilizing that moisture down deeper um, it was pretty short that was winter wheat uh, 2015 uh, winter wheat stubble um, I don't know probably four inches it wasn't much I you know yeah um, that's that's the surprising part of the fallow. I really expected to see fallow over the the summer, especially with all that heat, that we'd lose more moisture, especially out of that 12 inch at least sensor. Maybe I need to put a sensor in at six inches and see some more changes that way. But um, yeah, so it's a it's an ongoing deal. Uh, I'm kind of curious about it. You know, I was. Uh, I, th I think with the benefits of that forage production per acre and uh, then getting the recharge this fall, I, I really don't think it was anything lost. I'm, I'm kind of anticipating next spring uh, checking that moisture. It'll, and plus you get the soil health benefits, forming that soil structure, keeping a living root in there, everything that Marlin covered earlier. Uh, how much does that cost or how much does that pay back, I guess, uh, down the road through the rotation, uh, getting that diversity into the system. So. Um, I don't think on this one, or I've I've only known one producer that's ever done that. I think Aaron, didn't you do that on some cover crop stuff a couple years ago or last year? But yeah, we haven't seen that on cover crop mixes yet. We should probably look into doing more of that. Get our extension agent out there. <laughs> Jay Peer, he spoke and he gave a little presentation about the Minokin farm that they that they work out of it. One thing that he showed that was really interesting was a, a couple of slides on some cover crops that what they did was when they clipped those cover crops, they clipped the like the plant weights, uh, they kind of split it in half. Mm -hmm. So they, they tested like the top half of the plant weight for you know, like the crude protein values and everything, and also did that on the lower half.